Bloop a doop a doo. Bloop a doop a da ba There was music in the year 1991, believe it or not. And today, we're talking about the music from the year 1991. Brenda's got a baby. I think the cool thing about hip hop from this era and certainly mo much of Tupac's oeuvre is that it's like the storytelling era of hip hop. I know I sound a little curmudgeonly when I say that as if, you know, no rappers ever tell stories in their music anymore. And that's not true. But you can't really say that the bulk of hip hop that happened before and after this, this decade really, was as narrative. Most of Tupac's songs have a narrative within them, whether it's Brenda, whether it's even some of the ones people don't know as well. And I think that's one of the things that makes this period of hip hop special. I mean, before this, hip hop was in its like founding and beginning stages as like, I'm not trying to belittle it, but like DJ music, right? Like the, the function of it what is what I'm talking about here. Whereas today's hip hop, doesn't function as narratively either, at least, again, the bulk of it. There are a lot of great exceptions to this rule, like Kendrick Lamar comes to mind. But by and large, I, that's what I like the most about Tupac, is there's always a narrative. Yeah, and I think, like, social commentary also, right? Like, yeah. Uh, especially yeah. with Brenda's Got a Baby, you know, talking about this teen mother trying to get by with basically no resources available to her and the difficult life that she had. And I think it was really noteworthy at the time for being that kind of socially conscious hip hop, which at least in the mainstream, people had not really seen a lot of. And I think we are still getting a lot of socially conscious hip hop and story driven hip hop, but it's all on the indie side of mm -hmm. things. It's, it's not necessarily the stuff that's winning people's attention and, you know, Grammys and, and such. It's not um, getting radio play. Yeah. Also from a purely music musical analysis of this album, I like how heterogeneous it feels uh, and, and how there's lots of different influences in this era of hip hop. There's elements of jazz and, and mm -hmm. soul that in today's hip hop are still there sometimes, but at least in terms of mainstream hip hop I'm talking here, right? But frequently there are other elements like dance, for example, that are less prevalent here. And I find that interesting about this album. Amy Grant's album, Heart in Motion. Do either of you have any thoughts on any of those? Just that this was one of those ubiquitous albums that was literally on everybody's shelf and, and with good reason, but it didn't age well in that regard. It didn't uh, it didn't go very far past 91 in terms of, ooh, I love this song and I love this album and such. Yeah, Molly and I disagree. <laughs> we think it's still great. <laughs> I didn't say it wasn't good. I'm talking about in popular standing and you know the shuffle that people had in their car and those big CD sleeves. It didn't yeah, you don't hear you don't hear those songs often anymore. I guess is yeah. You do in the grocery store. Oh, <laughs> At least I do. That's true. I like a lot of the music from this album as sort of splashy, cheesy, fun pop music, but. I do slightly disagree with one of your points, Michael and Molly, which is that I don't think much of the music off of this that wasn't a single would have done well as a single. Yeah, but that's pop music, right? Yeah. There's singles and skips. Right. What I'm saying is there's a good amount of filler on the album, even if there are also some bangers. I don't actually love That's What Love Is For, but I get it. For when it came out, you know, it, it was very much of the style. Oh, legendary album. This Girl, was definitely you. like Friday night in the Pits and Dukes <laughs> Morris household listening to Bonnie Raitt while cooking dinner. Other than those two songs, I actually don't think that there's that much that I would have to say about this. I listened to it thinking that we would review the whole album, but it didn't connect with me other than those two songs because so much of it is soul yeah. and it's just not a genre that yeah. I personally connect with. She's really a blues soul artist. Yeah. So a lot of her music has that gritty, almost Mississippi blues, Delta blues sound. And her singing is just so good. And actually, if you have heard a recent recording of Bonnie Raitt, 
her her singing still sounds incredible you know and she's got to be like 70 years old and she's like still on it that album is legendary and i think those tracks in particular i can't make you love me is devastating mm -hmm. <laughs> and something to talk about is like so fun what a great song i could talk about I can't make you love me for like days and days. <laughs> it just encapsulates that feeling of unrequited love better than so many other songs do, which is saying something because so many other songs have been written about <laughs> unrequited love. I don't want to wax poetic because I know we have plenty more to talk about, but I do think it's worth mentioning that part of what makes that song great is the amazing piano provided by Bruce Hornsby. His style of playing, it's so amazing how he gets all those little blues grace notes in and with the right articulation to make you feel like you are just in that piano lounge hearing Bonnie Raitt and Bruce Hornsby like sell their hearts to you. There's a well-known cover of I Can't Make You Love Me by Bonnie Bear and I do actually really like Bonnie Bear. Like Bonnie Bear makes the subtext text and Bonnie it's subtle it's so subtle and delicate because it's yeah, supposed to be performed. that way she's supposed to have just given up yeah she's not in the throes of despair at the point right. when she's singing the song she's past that it's just pure resignation in her yeah. voice that like that does it for me that I was gonna say makes this different from all of the like light rock of the time that so many people so often lump it in with it's not Celine Dion it's not that it's like you say kind of understated and I think that's why it stands the test of time and why people like Bonnie Vare and newer artists still cover it Yes! It's my first cassette tape that I bought for myself. It was my first CD that I owned. My deepest, purest love in my little heart is for boys to men always. And this was the quintessential, most beautiful album for them. Every song on it is a smashing hit, or it could be. You have the absolute peak sound and harmony coming from them, all of their vocal technique, they've been refined. It's just the most beautiful debut that any group has ever made. And everyone that came after that was just getting better and better for like their full dozen years of heyday. Cooley High Harmony is where it began. It got tons of radio play. It put them on the map and made them one of the most successful groups of any genre of all time. Motown Philly obviously is just a chef's kiss track. There's a clip that I saw of them on MTV, like contemporary with this album release of them being on one of those like MTV like beach house shows or whatever. The host is like, can you sing us out to the commercial? And they do that dum 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 da, da, do, 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 da, like that thing that they do. And like it's so I yeah 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 like it's so flawless. Obviously I've heard Boys to Men's music, but I haven't heard this album really beyond the singles. And I think it's interesting how at least among my own personal circles, whenever the topic of boy bands would come up, it was always between like NSYNC and Backstreet Boys, right? And maybe somebody else. But it's a shame because Boys to Men was it. They were so talented and they wrote a lot of the music on this album, which you cannot say about other boy bands at the time. I cannot let you continue. Boys to Men is not a boy band. It will never be and has never been a boy band. I'm so sorry. I know a lot of people lump them into that genre. They are R&B very specifically. Boy bands were put together by a management company because they sounded good. Boys to Men has known each other since high school. Uh -huh. There's only four of them, not five. If people try to lump them in with boy bands, I can't control that, but they are not a boy band. What I wanted to say though, is that the Backstreet Boys have said that Boys to Men was one of their biggest influences and that they, they want- They can be an influence to... without being a boy yeah. band. Yeah, oh, absolutely. They want, they all, and NSYNC also, like they were trying to recreate what Boys to Men did because, and I know we're not talking about sales right now, but because Boys to Men was such a wildly commercially successful group, they wanted some of that, <laughs> right? They wanted the fame and the fortune and they wanted to do artistically what they were doing, but they created the boy band genre. Like that was why the producers were going out to put boys together to try to recreate some of that magic. And of course you don't get the same magic when you don't know each other from high school and all of that. 
they got so much attention from Three Feet High and Rising, and Three Feet High and Rising is just so much fun, and it's joyful, and they sort of got pigeonholed as, like, the goofy rap group. So then in De La Soul is Dead, they intentionally tried to be a little tougher, and I think it loses a little bit of the magic. It's still very good, but I think it loses a little bit of the magic that Three Feet High and Rising had which I only included because it has If We Hold On Together on it. Oh, that was going to be my next time. question. Which has I Touch Myself on it. I don't want and anybody else. I just laid it. <laughs> I kind of went a little Britney with that, didn't I? <laughs> I just laid it. <laughs> Such a fun song. Which has coming out of the dark on it. Coming out of the dark. If your mom ever turned on the mom rock station in the car, <laughs> you've heard it. This is not as good as her debut. It sort of feels like she's riffing a little bit on Madonna's success with like like a prayer, for instance. But the religious theme is sort of where those parallels end. <laughs> and like you said, called it the mom rock begins and Although I love my Gloria, it's not really to her credit. When you take her out of Miami Sound Machine, it's a lot less interesting, right? It's like you need that full force salsa. Oh, actually, this is important. We have With, to talk about this. <laughs> a, a double album release. It has November rain. It has November rain. Oh, yeah. Live and Let Die. Live and Let Die. Like that kind of... <laughs> November Rain is like one of the all-time great like hair metal power ballads. I mean, I know nobody likes hair metal power ballads, but there is a time and a place for hair metal power ballads, okay? You know, one thing's for certain, Guns N' Roses was not a boy band. <laughs> yes, they were not. Are you making fun of me? I will come down to Houston and I will cut you. <laughs> Most of the later Joni Mitchell career stuff is not as great, but this does have the song Come In From The Cold on it, which is fantastic. The opening lyrics of the song. Back in 1957, we had to dance a foot apart, and they hawk-eyed us from the sidelines, holding their rulers without a heart. And so with just a touch of our fingers, oh, it would make our circuitry explode. And all we ever wanted was to come in from the cold. Joni Mitchell <laughs> is one of the all-time greats. Yeah. You, know, you, can't you can't come for her. Never forget. Right. right, that Joni Mitchell is a giant of yeah. the genre. Yeah. <laughs> and the only reason like, I want to say never forget is because I think people do forget because they talk about Bob Dylan and they talk about Paul McCartney and they talk about Woody Guthrie and, you know, those kinds. And it's like, Joni Mitchell is over here in the cold, <laughs> being overlooked. And I think it's just misogyny. It's like covert, right? Like it's maybe not even the people talking about it don't even realize that they're dismissing Joni Mitchell because she's a woman. But you cannot say that her songwriting isn't as good as Bob Dylan's. And I think that's a controversial statement even today. Which has, it ain't over till it's over. It ain't over till it's over is cheesy and it kind of goes on a little bit too long, but it's fun. I like it. I feel like Lenny Kravitz was not on my radar until Are You Gonna Go My Way? And then not again until he did a cover of American Woman like in the late 90s. Is Lenny Kravitz just kind of like a one hit wonder that has like four hits? I was disappointed because I saw that this album had It Ain't Over Till It's Over, which is actually maybe my favorite Lenny Kravitz song, which probably says that Lenny Kravitz isn't really for me because that's not really typical of his style. But anyway, I was disappointed because I looked at the album and, and the rest of the tracks and I was like, oh, that's, <laughs> that's it. But I did discover a fun fact, which is that Guns N' Roses' guitarist Slash co-wrote some of this album with him. Oh, I have all the feels for this album. Do you, do you get it? This is Mariah Carey in her early prime, which is sort of funny because it's still in the period when her, I'm forgetting the name of him, but her ex-husband who was the producer was kind of controlling her career in some pretty seedy ways. But this album just has lots of greats on it. Most people are familiar with the title track, which is amazing, but so is Make It Happen, which I like a lot. It's also got Can't Let Go on it, which isn't one of my favorite Mariah Carey songs, but it's worth mentioning. It's, it's not bad. 
great pop album by one of the best pop vocalists of the 90s. Her singing is awesome, at least at this stage in her career. The title track put the term whistle tone into all of our vocabularies, right? I know I personally had never heard anybody do that before. <laughs> and I know that there were singers in like the 70s that were doing that. I had never heard a, a human voice do that before. And like now I'm an opera singer and I'm like, oh yeah, people do that. Like it's not that big a deal. But in pop music, you just don't hear it very often. I think it's easy to predict from this album what Mariah Carey would become, which was like one of the greatest pop stars of the 90s. One like little footnote, while it's true that the whistle tone in emotions is like one of the things people remember the most about that song, I actually think the rest of her singing is more impressive than Oh the yeah, it's and, and it's a bop, right? Like that song is so fun. Listening to her <laughs> belt at that stage in her career, it's like so meaty and pingy in a way that it kind of hasn't been since you know post glitter after Mariah. after fantasy after that when she wrote was it butterfly was that the album after that she starts doing the breathy thing it's kind of the same way that ariana grande has gone with her mm -hmm. singing which is so funny because ariana grande always got compared to mariah carey which has enter sandman sad but true and the unforgiven on it oh this is an iconic album yeah, it's a huge album yeah i'm not necessarily a metalhead but i have been married to a metalhead and first of all enter sandman is the heavy metal song that like broke out to everybody you hear it at college football games played by the marching band you hear it at baseball games as walk-up music you hear it on tv commercials and movies it's everywhere even still like 20 30 years later it's that build-up right that dun, 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 dun. Right? And it just keeps going for so mm -hmm. long before finally when it hits, it's the same thing that like really good dance music does. When finally that ba da 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 da, when that comes in, you go crazy, <laughs> right? It's so good. That's probably their best song. It makes me think of what we talked about, like pop versus rock. That is obviously ostensibly a rock song, but because it broke out in such an enormous way into popular culture, it becomes a pop song, mm -hmm. even though it does not have the trappings of pop music. It's just such a great song. This album is iconic you know the other songs too sad but true unforgiven what i think is like metallica part of their name sort of lends themselves to this and it's very much by design but they're synonymous with metal music which has remember the time heal the world in black or white on it while much has been said about michael jackson and his life and career by us even <laughs> by us as well as by many others i just want to say that black and white is one of my favorite michael jackson songs there are many others that people sort of flock to first like thriller like billy jean like the big the really big hits and and black and white was big too i was gonna say the same thing ramin it's always fun to go back to it and remember what it was like when the video came out it's fun it's poppy and i think it's i think it's very much in line with michael jackson's sort of evolution this is like firmly in his middle period of his works it's a good album i owned it it was worth listening to in the car a lot and you know just enjoying it for what it was but black and white is really still a very good song i think the video was iconic remember with the faces fading yeah, <laughs> yeah and tyra banks oh. that video blew people's minds when it came I, out like the, like that, that was a brand new technology. I feel like it was one of the first ones to use some of those like digital effects and things like that. Oh, it was definitely that face fade thing was a brand new technology that had never been done before. And like, people were just like amazed by it. I also think that Remember the Time is one of the most underrated Michael Jackson songs. And that video, was it Lisa Marie Presley? Yeah, it was. What's it was again? Lisa Marie wrestling because it was when they were married and the whole like Egypt sort of thing. The thing about that I think about when I think about Michael Jackson is great dance cuts in videos and that video even though like people think of like the scenes in like the bathtub or whatever with Lisa Marie I think of like there's a great Egypt you know walk like an Egyptian dance break in it that is so fun. But Heal the World is overrated so. Oh Heal the World was just corny. It, you know it was
was just of the time. Yeah, yeah. It was very of the time. And as cheesy as it is, it was important in the way it was used for a lot of like these foundational things that he tried to do or tried to contribute to. And it was used the world over for fundraisers and things like that. It does have merit, but I don't know that I would even call it a good song. It just has a good track record. Well, that it's was one of bad. those ones where they brought in like a whole bunch of celebrities, right? Isn't it Whitney Houston in there? It's and a band-aid like, type thing. Yeah, yeah. band-aid type thing. Thing. which has promise of a new day and rush rush on it rush rush okay <laughs> i know a lot of people don't love rush rush the way that they love cold-hearted snake or opposite right attract but i unironically <laughs> like rush rush i think it's good i love promise of a new day i like that <laughs> one too actually but it, it's Every cheesy love huh? it come to me i switched back to rush rush because i like that one more. <laughs> and then keanu reeves in the video for no apparent reason <laughs> i mean why not put some eye candy in your video <laughs> excellent <laughs> This album came out after Freddie Mercury died. He had died earlier in 1991. But this album has Under Pressure, I Want It All, I Want to Break Free, and The Show Must Go On. So we didn't talk about any of those songs when they were released on albums, on full albums, but those are the ones that stuck out to me on this Greatest Hits album. Yeah. Last. They're all great because Queen is great. I, one of the best rock bands of all time. All the accolades they have, they have for good reason and they deserve. Under Pressure is a great song. Under Pressure. And also some of the songs that were late that... Freddie Mercury wrote like when he was dying are phenomenal. Yeah. Which I, is mostly known for Give It Away and especially Under the Bridge. I love Under the Bridge. It's such a like operatic. I don't even mean that in like if you take out the choral vocals, right. I think it's still structured sort of in an operatic sort of way. Yeah. However, I don't think Give It Away holds up. I think Give It Away holds up. I also, I'm with Molly on this one. The thing that Red Hot Chili Peppers were famous for was this fusion of funk and rock. And Give It Away, I think, is the best exemplifier of that because it has that sort of funk guitar and that groove to it and that's the song that i most picture them performing naked with socks on their penises <laughs> it's obviously a gimmick but it's something they were so famous for and it was like this sort of like look how edgy we are like we're not gonna wear clothes we're gonna perform on stage naked <laughs> you know when i think of like the hair <laughs> the mm. head banging <laughs> when that song comes on i'm like oh yeah this is such a groove but i think you're right under the bridge is is like the great song off of this album and I think from that band. Honestly, I've never been a huge Red Hot Chili Peppers fan from their entire career. They've just never really done it for me, but Under the Bridge is an exception. I think it's exceptional. Yeah, I mean, Anthony Kiedis' vocals on that song are so smooth. It's a great song. And then you get to see his tits bounce in slow motion when he runs in the video which has Losing My Religion, Near Wild Heaven, and Shiny Happy People on it. We've said plenty. Do either of you have anything to say? Just another quintessential album from this year. It's so important to R.E.M.'s whole lineup. Losing My Religion was such a ubiquitous song through most of the 90s. Like, it got radio play for, like, years or something because oh, you'd still. always hear it. Yeah, yeah. And it was so absolutely deserved. That song made me fall in love with R.E.M., but this album was always like, oh, this is why I love this band, and you go back to that. Which has crazy on it, which I love crazy. We are never gonna survive. It's such a fun song. Yeah. Yeah, that's a fun song. I don't have anything else to say about that's, it. Yeah, that's about it, yeah. <laughs> and he's got a great voice too, just distinctive. And like the face and the body, right? I mean, it was good enough for Heidi Klum for, you know. I was about to say, he's married yeah. to Heidi Klum, so. Not uh, anymore. <laughs> which has Little Miss Can't Be Wrong and Two Princes on it. They're two hits. They're two hits. <laughs> yeah, one, two. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think this is an important album or an important band, but those two songs were just super fun songs that you heard everywhere. And I think they hold up, honestly, for what they are, right? Which is just super fun songs. Yeah. The songs are nonsense, pretty much, right? Like the song about the two princes, it's like, I'm just making up a weird story about two guys fighting for some Mara, yeah. woman. Oh, Mara. <laughs> to me, bands like Spin Doctors are like the flip side of the coin of Nirvana. There are a 
other rock bands in this era that are very serious and deserving of praise, of course. But this is basically pop rock, right? I think we can call it that. And I think that even though I respect Nirvana more, I would rather listen to this music. It just takes me back to a time when I'm like at a bestie's pool birthday party and we're about to open his presents. And, you know, I don't want a prince of art to be. I have no idea what <laughs> I'm the one a prince and lover ought to be. Which has one who's going to ride your wild horses and mysterious ways on it. It's not Joshua Tree. It's not Joshua Tree, but I think Mysterious Ways is a really, really good song. Yeah, that and Who's Gonna Ride Your Wild Horses are like two of my all-time U2 favorites. To me, the great U2 album is Joshua Tree. There is a band's best album, but the other ones can still be good and you can listen to those too. I think in U2's case... Joshua Tree is so good, and the other one's really pale in comparison. Mm -hmm. Which has Save the Best for Last on it. Oh, oh I was thinking Vanessa that's so <laughs> Yeah, no, Save the Best for Last. I actually, so there's a weird Molly story where, like, I wrote a song for my mother for Mother's Day called Save the Best for Mom. Isn't this world <laughs> a crazy place? I used to love that song. It's a pretty song. So much. I thought it was, like, the most beautiful song. It's sappy, but it's pretty. It's so sappy. All right. So that's it for going through stuff. Now we've got games. Game time. Game so, time. Game time. This year we are not doing Grammys because the Grammys fell in a weird spot in the middle of the year. We're also not going to do Rolling Stone and Pitchfork because like the issue that we ran into last time where there were no duplicates on the Rolling Stone and Pitchfork list. And so it was just like, tied for one, tied for two, tied for three, so on. They was like that again this year. And it's a lot of stuff that we didn't talk about in this, things that I don't think we would have thought of as mm. important. But we can talk about best-selling albums. So Ramin, what do you think <laughs> was one of the best-selling albums from 1991. Tough, because this has a lot of critically acclaimed stuff that may not have necessarily been popular yet. I'm going to go with what I think is a safe choice. Queen Greatest Hits. I can see the rush on the album right after Freddie Mercury dies. Rush. Rush. Molly, you're up. I think it's Amy Grant, Heart in Motion. Amy Grant. That's what love is for. Michael, while you're looking for the answers, we could get, provide musical interlude. <laughs> <laughs> that was not one of them. What? Oh. It's not a bestseller. I'm so mad. I'm wrong. <laughs> Erica, to you. I'm going with my boys. Boys to men, Cooley High oh. Harmony. They also were not one of them. Not a chance. Yes, a chance. They were not one of the top 10 albums in my sales. What, did it come out in November or something? <laughs> Eric is looking for a loophole. It doesn't mean that they're not number 11, right? And that's, yeah. that would still be one of the best-selling albums out of hundreds well, of albums. I'm going with another safe bet, Michael Jackson. It's number three. I mean, he gets eight points. Molly. Uh, I think Nirvana. I was going to guess that. Nirvana was number two. Ooh. Ooh. Nine points. Erica. Mariah Carey emotions. Mariah Carey also was not one of them. <sighs> For heaven's sake. Really? That surprises me. Back to remain. Oh no, give it to someone else. Um, this is not my guess, but does anyone else think it's super pretentious that Guns N' Roses has Use Your Illusion 1 and 2? Because <laughs> <It's not laughs> really they were sold as separate albums. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go with U2. U2. It's number five. Remain gets wow. six points. Never forget the ubiquitous popularity of U2 in the 90s. To Molly. I feel like I want to say Garth Brooks. Garth Brooks was number 10. Erica. Pearl Jam 10. Pearl Jam was number 6. Erica gets 5 points. About time. Back to remain. I don't know if we're, I'm allowed to even ask this question, but we talked about Paula Abdul's Opposites Attract last video, right? I think it's two videos ago. I'm torn between like two or three choices. I'm, I guess I'll, now that I've asked, I guess I'll go with Paula Abdul. That's not one of them. Okay. I'm going to say Metallica. It's number one. Wow. Good guess, Malls. <laughs> Erica. R.E.M. out of time. That was not one of the top ten. Damn. I was going to guess that. Erica's out in this round. For me. See, I feel like none of these is amazingly popular at the time. I guess I'll go with Red Hot Chili Peppers. That's what I would have guessed. Oh, really? They're not on the list? Wow. Um, not on the top 10. Oh, see, I would have guessed them. Okay. So my guess now is Guns N' Roses. Which one? <laughs> That's a very good question. I'm going to go with one. That was number eight. 
Three points for Molly. Two remain. I took the lead. See, I feel like the obvious thing to do now is to guess the other Guns N' Roses one, but... I would do. Sure. I'll guess the other Guns N' Roses one. That was number nine. Okay. Two points for remain. Oh, are we tied? Oh, we're oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. It's this one to win it, I feel. Oh, no, I have two more strikes. Mm-hmm. To Apocalypse Now. <sighs> oh, I'm torn between a few. Just remember that Mom Rock always does better than we think it will. Yeah, I'm. You know what, Erica? I was debating Gloria Stefan. I'm gonna. That's my final answer, Regis. I am sorry, you are out in this round. I was not what I was thinking. <laughs> yeah, but if Molly fails, I still technically win. Well, there's one more game, also. I'm gonna say Bonnie Raitt. It is not Bonnie Raitt. So we are all out in this round. Ah. Oh, the... I know what it is. What is it? I think it's Diana Ross. It's not. Oh. It's well, Genesis. Fuck. That was going to be my other guess. <laughs> okay, but we've got another game. So I'm going to wipe away your errors. Billboard Hot 100 time. <gasps> uh, so now we are starting with Erica. Okay, Hot 100. So this is in 1991. Yes, this is, a, and but not all of these songs are necessarily from 1991. I, I am a loyal fangirl. I'm going to go with Boys to Men Motown Philly. That's a really solid guess. It tested. Molly approved. That was number 11. <sighs> That's brutal. <laughs> there are quite a few good guesses here. I'm going to go with Amy Grant. Baby, baby. Amy Grant, baby, baby. Number 10. I mean, gets one point. Molly. I think it's everybody dance now. Another good <laughs> guess. Whenever I was taking dance class, that was like our warm-up song. Everybody dance now. That was number three. Eight points for Molly. <laughs> Oh, to Erica. Bette Midler from a distance. Oh, I was going to guess that. Oh, that's a good one. From a distance. That song was on this list, but it's not where you want it. To be. What? Uh, but it was so big. I mean, this is the 15th most played song that year. That is still huge. Is it Mika? Yeah. I feel like going off of the album's list isn't a bad strategy. So I'm going to go with Paula Abdul. Rush, rush. Hurry, mm-hmm. hurry, points. Come to me. That was number four. Ramin gets seven points. Ha <laughs> ha! Eat it, Molly. Tie it again. Brian Adams. Everything I do. Everything I do. I'm doing for you. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta poop real bad. <laughs> <laughs> wow, number one. Shit. That was that was gonna be my next guest, too, because that was the year that was like, you know, it was everywhere. Yeah. Erica. Oh, I wish it was extremes more than words. That was my first slow dance when I was 14. Do you want that to be your guess? No, I don't know. This is probably going out on a limb, but Jesus Jones right here, right now. I kind of love that song, though. I'm trying I kind of do, too. Goes. I feel like right. I don't... That's what it is. Okay. Wait, what is it? Right here, right now. Yeah. All I could hear in my head was the Van Halen right now. Yeah. Nope. Fortunately, that is not it. Erica is out in this round. Oh, brutal. Ramin. I think the level of risk of this choice will determine how racist people were in 1991. <laughs> yes, this and only this determines that. <laughs> I'm going to pick Janet Jackson. Love will never do without you. Because I remember that that sexy music video was really popular. And also, it's a great song. <laughs> Oh, you kill it. See? Super racist, I'm telling you. Okay, I was about to say Marky Mark and the Funky Bunch, but I'm I'm going to... Then I saw you're unbelievable. Whoa. And so I think that's got to be it. <laughs> okay, EMF. Like, anything that's on a Jock Jams album, I feel like <laughs> has to be on the list. That was number six. Molly gets five points. You know what? I'm sticking with Erica's intuition here. More than words. If that's it, I quit. I'm sorry, but I kind of hate that song. I, I kind of hate it too, but like in a I love it way. Oh, Erica. <laughs> I'm done. It's all I have to do. Okay, now I want to say good vibrations. That's good vibrations. That's that one. Oh, that's that one? Yeah, that was not it. That was number 20. Oh, wow. Oh, you know what? He didn't drop his pants enough, I guess. I don't remember because I love you. I don't either. I don't I don't know who's okay. going to oh, I really love the song best. Kissing Game, but I don't think that's on the top 10. I love that Whitney song, and I'm close to picking it, but I also don't think it was top 10 Whitney. I'm going to go with the theory that sex sells. I want to sex you up. That's a good guess. That 
is number two. Nine points for Amin. Damn Yankees high enough is underrated. I'm just going to say that. I'm going to go with... um. You don't know all the love that I need? All the man that I need, you mean? Yeah, isn't that what I said? I don't think I do, but you know what? I think that's my guess. Whitney was... Come on, come on. Uh, healing me. For me. Now, you see, Molly, Whitney was eclipsed in this era by another starlet, Mariah Carey, someday. Someday. When you get a ten So it's all these songs that we don't know. Uh-huh. What if Molly gets a third strike, but then I do too? That is like the most humiliating. <laughs> I don't know who Stevie B is, but the fact that it has a parenthetical postman song, it, I don't know. That just ma- makes me feel good. Is that what you're going for? Yeah, I'm going for that. Okay. That was number two. Uh-huh. Molly's out. Oh. I mean, you've got one shot. Let let me really figure out my odds here. There are five blank spaces and five people left. The only one of these songs I think I actually know is the High Five song. I don't think I know. Is that what you want to go for? Well, hold on a minute. Okay. <laughs> because I like it more than the others, that makes me want to pick it. But the fact that Color Me Bad was already on there makes me want to pick Color Me Bad. Now, this is for the whole year, you said, right? Mm-hmm. But I don't think I really know that Color Me Bad song. I adore. Yeah, nope. I'm going to learn from my mistakes and not go with the song I like more. Color Me Bad. Color Me Bad? Okay, Color Me Bad was 18. (sighs) Molly wins. At number nine was Surface the First Time. At number eight was... Damn Yankees. No, not... High Five was not number eight. No. I don't know that song. I don't either. And number five was... Timmy T. Timmy T. Now I want to listen to that one. Okay, so that's it for this one. Any big observations about songs, albums, or anything that we talked about? I mean, I already said that the albums list is very white. Yeah. I also think the Queen Greatest Hits album, I'm assuming, got a bump when Freddie Mercury died. And it's interesting that he died of AIDS at a time when it was still very stigmatized. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if that influenced that uh, at all. Like, that people are like, oh no, we still love Freddie Mercury and Mm -hmm. we're still gonna go buy this Queen album and remember this music that we loved from this person that we just lost. Right. So in 1991, when he died, did they release that that was his cause of death or did we find that out later? No, I think it was known. Yeah, I think so. I'm assuming that it was known. It's a good question. Mm -hmm. In October 1986, Two months after Mercury's final live performance, the British newspapers reported that Mercury had been tested for HIV AIDS. He was quoted as saying he was perfectly fit and healthy. Mercury said in an interview that he had tested negative for HIV. So it kind of sounds like it was an open secret. Mm, Good old tabloids being dicks about stuff. Thanks so much for watching. Give this video a like if you liked it. Give it a pity like if you didn't like it. Let us know any comments that you have about anything that we said or any of these songs that we might have missed. Let us know below which of those songs that we don't know anything about should we know something about. To this side of Ramin, there will be a video that YouTube thinks you might like, so check that out. Up above Ramin diagonally that way, there will be uh, the link to follow our channel. We do reviews of video games and music mostly, but we do some other stuff sometimes too. And that should be about it. So thanks so much for watching. Maintain your groovy selves. Bye-bye.